Good afternoon, everyone in Israel, and good morning in the United States, and also welcome to all of our viewers on the webcast. We have a thousand people who registered for this conference online, so welcome to all of you. Um, our keynote speaker this afternoon is Professor Robert Putnam, who is the Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. He's the past president of the American Political Science Association, and he received the International Political Science Association Carl Deutsch Award for cross-disciplinary research. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the British Academy, and a former dean of the Kennedy School. Bob, as he told me I must call him, has written over 15 books translated into 20 languages. Among those books is one called Making Democracy Work, which The Economist said was a great work of social science worthy to rank alongside de Tocqueville, Pareto, and Weber. He's also written two other major books that have had a massive influence on my field, Bowling Alone and American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us. His most recent book is titled The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Just to give you some idea of how significant Professor Putnam is in our field, I'm going to uh, give you some of his list of quantitative citations, citations in numbers. Now, citations aren't everything, but they are, in, they are um, a good marker. So, his article about a two-level game in international negotiations is cited 13,000 times. The most cited article of articles published in the decade 2000 to 2010 in international relations was cited 3,800 times. His book, Making Democracy Work, has been cited over 50,000 times. Bowling Alone, over 75,000 times. Now apparently, according to Blue Book Scholar, yeah, that is more than the number one uh, cited person in political science. So I don't know why, but you're not under the title of political science according to Google Scholar. <laughs> in 2013, he received the National Humanities Medal, the United States' highest honor for contribution to the humanities. The Sunday Times has called him the most influential academic in the world today. And that's significant because he's not just an academic, he's very much a public intellectual. He is the co-founder of the Seguro Seminar, which brings together leading thinkers and practitioners to develop actionable ideas for civic renewal. Its alumni have gone on to distinguish careers in politics, civil society, and public life. You might have heard of one of them, Barack Obama. His counsel has been sought by leaders on both sides of the aisle and on both sides of the Atlantic. Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama, Prime Ministers Blair and Cameron. He also has 16 honorary degrees from eight countries, including the University of Oxford. So it is my pleasure and my honor to present to you Professor Robert Putnam. Thanks very much. Um, can you hear me all? Um, I just want to make sure it's working good. Well, it's a great um, and somewhat unexpected honor for me as a social scientist to be speaking to this distinguished group of theologians and moral philosophers and friends of uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. I am here because Rabbi Sachs had such a capacious mind and such a wide-ranging set of interests that about 20 years ago, he and I became first transatlantic colleagues, and then I dare say even personal friends. I want to begin these remarks with a strange tale that came to interest both Rabbi Sachs and me in recent years. In, in 1831, within nine months of each other, Two intrepid youths from privileged backgrounds embarked from Europe with little fanfare and completely unbeknownst 
to each other on a pair of extraordinary adventures on the far side of the world. Their separate voyages would take each of them into uncharted lands and seas, through treacherous waters, trackless wastes, and primeval forests. Their lives were often in jeopardy as they mounted snowy uplands, followed woodland trails, plunged down river, uh, river rapids, braved wild animals, were attacked by swarms of unknown insects, and encountered virtually unknown tribes and strangers with guns. In the end, thanks to good fortune, quick wit, and perhaps a benevolent deity, each of these two young men, barely out of adolescence, independently surmounted these challenges. Each of them had gazed on magnificent vistas, had endured almost unendurable hardships, and had discovered unexpected patterns of life. They had completed two extraordinary voyages, remarkably parallel, but utterly independent. Though they were young, their lives had been changed forever by these two independent voyages. More important and even less foreseen to everyone's astonishment, the journals, the daily journals that each of them kept meticulously each night would change our understanding of society and of life itself. Nearly two centuries later, our own world is, important, is in important ways guided by and roiled by controversies about their fundamental discoveries. In fact, their, ins their insights turn out to be directly relevant to issues like vaccination and mask mandates and global warming that dominate our lives today. These two young men were Charles Darwin, age 22, and Alexis de Tocqueville, age 26. I began to explore these two lives nearly two years ago. Though I searched long and hard, I learned that only one other scholar had ever even noticed the parallels between these two voyages of discovery, much less understood the great moral and practical significance of these two voyages. That prescient and profound scholar, with a remarkable breadth of knowledge, was, of course, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. In these brief remarks, I want to summarize these twin stories of Darwin and Tocqueville that fascinated both Rabbi Sachs and me. And then in the end, I will turn to the broader implications for our lives today that both Rabbi Sachs and I independently arrived at. As Tocqueville stepped aboard the ship Le Havre on April 2nd, 1831, and as a few months later, Darwin boarded the Beagle in Plymouth, England in December, they were departing from a Europe in the midst of revolutionary changes in politics, economics, society, culture, and science. The aftershocks of the American and then the French Revolution from 1776 to 1815 were still reverberating politically. The Industrial Revolution was rapidly transforming all aspects of society, productivity, transportation, class and gender relations, education and literacy, transportation, communication, secularization, nationalism, and globalism. The Industrial Revolution was twinned with rapid scientific progress in the fields of physics and chemistry and um, thermodynamics and electricity and geology and paleontology and biology. Indeed, the word scientist itself was, in, was, was coined in 1833, while the two men were on their voyages. In music and art and literature, an equally thoroughgoing revolution from classicism to romanticism was taking place, from Mozart to Mendelssohn, from Samuel Johnson to Byron, Keats, and Shelley. In all these ways, the world in which Tocqueville and Darwin had come of age was defined by groundbreaking innovation. The moment seemed unusually propitious for original thinking. As Tocqueville himself put it, a new science was needed 
for a world altogether new. Against this historical backdrop, these two young patricians, and they were patricians, commenced simultaneous but unconnected scientific inquiries that would take them into unexplored parts of the new world. Each was the son of a renowned lineage, but both had been raised far from the centers of national power in London and in Paris. As boys, both had been thought precocious, but neither was recognized as a budding genius. Both came from well-to-do families, which enabled them to pursue their research without undue concern about their finances. Like much scientific exploration in that era, each voyage was government-sponsored, but both voyages were mostly privately funded, and in neither case did the government sponsors actually understand the real objective of the ambitious young traveler. That unspoken but passionately held goal was, in each case, to learn as much as possible about the new worlds, natural and biological in the case of Darwin, social and political in the case of Tocqueville, into which each was venturing. Each was accompanied by a similarly young, critically important colleague and friend, though the friendship in Tocqueville's case with Gustave de, Mo de Mo Beaumont, a young jurist, grew closer throughout their lives, whereas the friendship in Darwin's case with Robert Fitzroy, the captain of the Beagle, ended in rivalry and bitterness and even eventually tragedy. Both voyagers would eventually become deeply involved in national politics. They didn't begin as politicians, but both got, became involved eagerly in Tocqueville's case, reluctantly in Darwin's case. Most important, each traveler would prove to be a vivid writer. Each upon his arrival home would produce a wildly popular account of his voyage. These were among the first bestsellers um, in the modern world. And each would eventually write a second tome, Democracy in America and On the Origin of Species, that would fundamentally alter our understandings of our world and ourselves. Framing these two expeditions, as I have and as Jonathan did, together allows us to see each voyage stereoscopically and highlights fundamental but hitherto obscure features of intellectual inquiry in contemporary life. First, although hundreds of other explorers, both men and women, had trod similar paths in the 19th century, globe-trotting naturalists in the case of Darwin, European visitors, of whom there were many in the case of Tocqueville, these two travelers stand far above that crowd. There were hundreds of them, but these were almost unique. Each was a remarkably keen and tireless observer of detail. That was what first struck others about both of them, that they were really detailed guys. They were both omnivorous empiricists. Darwin scrutinized geological strata and insects and volcanic dust and plants and animals of all sorts, fossils and coral reefs, where Tocqueville chatted for hours with hundreds of Americans, presidents, past and present, drunken backwoodsmen, pioneers and their long-suffering wives, clergy of all sorts, Harvard intellectuals, businessmen, large and small, Indian guides, and even an occasional black slave. At a deep level, there was a real similarity between Tocqueville and Darwin. Unlike superficial travelers, they wrote, they both wrote compellingly because they were so keenly observant. Darwin of the natural world, with glances at society, and Tocqueville of society, with glances at nature. Both kept detailed daily notebooks, recording what they had seen and heard. These heaps of notebooks would eventually take each of them years to organize and synthesize. As one writer has said, when Tocqueville came home from America with piles of unsorted notes and a trunk full of documents, he was nowhere near ready to write. First, he would need to undertake intensive research and thinking that would eventually take eight years to complete. In Darwin's case, that same task would ultimately take several decades. 
Each, strikingly, each also had an uncanny ability to step away from the trees and the leaves to see the broader forest and to reflect on its significance. As Darwin put it, observing and reasoning. Darwin's role model, Alexander von, Hol uh, von Humboldt, had recommended that a researcher should connect the little things with the bigger picture. And both Darwin and Tocqueville seem intuitively to have followed that maxim. As Tocqueville noted, in America, I saw more than America. And each only gradually realized the immense importance of what he was coming to understand. In Tocqueville's flowery French, he described what he sought to understand as he came to understand his own voyage. His, he said he was seeking to understand this is flowery French, the future of democracy, the sole poetic idea of our time, an immense idea, an era of total change in the social system of humanity. Darwin was more plain spoken. He stated his audacious goal in simple English. He was trying to understand the first appearance of new beings on this earth. As their journeys progressed and their knowledge of the Americas, north or south, expanded, each encountered evidence that would eventually lead to the ideas for which he would become famous. Evolution and natural selection, in Darwin's case, case habits of the heart, and self-interest rightly understood. Those were the two key phrases in Tocqueville's case. But these ideas were not preformed deductive hypotheses to be tested. But they rather, rather, they emerge gradually from an accumulation of apparently unrelated observations. Moreover, unlike most of their predecessors, these men were interested not merely in static comparison, France versus America, or the finch's beak, this finch's beak versus that finch's beak. They were interested instead in understanding change, biological change or social change. That focus on dynamics was what gave their respective theories such unusual power. Now, of course, I understand, and Rabbi Sachs understood, these two voyages, these two lives, and these two theories are far from perfectly parallel. For example, his friend Fitzroy played a very different role in Darwin's later life than did Beaumont in Tocqueville's life. Darwin would have preferred much less involvement in public life than he had, whereas Tocqueville would have preferred much more involvement in public life. The origin of species is the culmination of work begun in his first journals called The Voyage of the Beagle, whereas volume two of Democracy in America, which was Tocqueville's second volume, is to some extent a treatment of a different topic that is treatment of France rather than just America. Almost certainly to be sure the global impact of of origin of the species continues to be greater than the impact of democracy of democracy in America. And if we had citations, citation indices going back two centuries of the sort that we just heard described in my case, for the origin, for origin of the species, the citations are probably in order of magnitude greater than that of democracy. I don't want to say these are identical researchers. The ultimate focus of Darwin's inquiry, which is the origins of life, um, is even more basic than the focus of Tocqueville's inquiry, which is the conditions for democracy. On the other hand, studies of how frequently the words um, Tocqueville or Darwin or evolution or democracy um, uh, have, suggest that these have had broadly similar ups and downs over the 200, nearly 200 years since they were written. And both, both of these, that is, both the, uh, the word uh, Darwin and Tocqueville, or the word evolution and democracy, are even more prominent today than they were when they originally wrote. That is, these books, these two books and these two men, are even more visible today, even more prominent today, than they were uh, at, the, at the time of their own lives. In short, nearly two centuries after these two young men began their respective voyages, the echoes of those voyages continued to reverberate in rhythm. 
These two unexpectedly parallel voyages of discovery are of no more, are of more than merely antiquarian interest. This is not just about history of science. Because they convey some remarkable lessons well beyond the specifics of these two narratives. First, the extraordinary impact of Darwin and Tocqueville, especially in comparison with the hundreds of other researchers and thousands of other travelers who took similar voyages at the same time as these two voyages, it tells us much about the nature of scientific inquiry. Both of them were precocious masters of previous scholarship and writings, part of what both acquired, had acquired before their voyages is an implicit framework of interpretation. They both had what later Louis Pasteur would call the prepared mind. They didn't know what they were going to find, but they had acquired outlooks that would under, help them understand what they were seeing. Um, and secondly, as I noted earlier, a comparison of Darwin and Tocqueville shows the power of integrating intensely close observation with very wide-ranging abstraction. That unusual combination of meticulous attention to detail and soaring interest in abstraction and generalization, generalization set them apart from virtually all their fellows, their fellow travelers and their fellow scientists or scholars. And finally, and this is the most important insight gleaned from this comparison between Darwin and Tocqueville, each produced a major theory of biology and of society, respectively, that recognized the tension between the individual and the community. This, this tension between individualism and communitarianism is exactly what first drew Jonathan Sachs and I together in, in, in intellectual terms. And Darwin and Tocqueville forged remarkably parallel syntheses of competition and cooperation. It is on this fundamental point that Rabbi Sachs and I turn out to understand the implication of the comparison between Darwin and Tocqueville. Because now, as I come to a conclusion, I want to say, what did both Jonathan Sachs and I, independently, come to understand from what, what would otherwise be, be a merely an interesting historical tale? For millennia, for millennia, a central divide among Western political thinkers and activists has pit the individualists against the communitarians, the former, the individualists, are more concerned about rights, the latter, the communitarians, are more concerned about responsibilities. Individualists emphasize liberty and individuality, and they criticize communitarians as conformist and intolerant, whereas communitarians emphasize equality and altruism and criticize individualists as narcissistic and selfish. In short, individualists focus on I, and communitarians focus on we. Quite remarkably, that's, that's exactly the way Jonathan Sachs and I independently came to describe this relationship, the relationship between I and we. This framework, this individual versus communitarianism, is ubiquitous in policy debates and in social, in the social sciences. Generally speaking, this division cuts across the familiar left-right dimension, that is, conservative communitarians and their progressive counterparts make common cause against excessive individualism, while libertarians and progressive individualists unite to oppose repressive institutions. All sides assume that individualist competition and communitarian cooperation are poles apart. And, to revert now for a minute to Darwin and Tocqueville, at first glance, the theories of these two intellectual giants seem polar opposites. Darwin's theory of evolution rests on the idea of competition and the survival of the, fiddle, of the fiddlest, red in tooth and claw. Darwin, the emphasis on competition. Inexorably, the fiercest lizards and the most vigorous frigate birds on the Galapagos Islands um, would have more progeny, outcompeting others in their, of their species, and in, therefore in natural selection, Competition appears to be the order of the day. Darwin is seen as the great, falsely, as the great art, um, exponent of competition. Conversely, Tocqueville's theory of democracy famously 
exalted Americans' habits of cooperation and their propensity to form to associations to solve, um, to solve common problems. I'll quote, I'll quote briefly from Tuffet. In America, I often admired the infinite art with which the inhabitants of the United States managed to fix a common goal to the efforts of, his, of many men to get them to advance it freely. As soon as se of several of the inhabitants of the United States have conceived of an idea or a sentiment that they want to produce in the world, they seek each other out. And when they have found each other, they unite. So, Darwin, advocate of competition or exponent of competition, Tocqueville, exponent of, of uh, cooperation. But as you delve deeply, both Rabbi Sachs and I have seen the paradoxical importance of social cooperation for Darwin and of individual competition for Tocqueville. Darwin argued that humans survive only in cooperating groups, groups that often require self-sacrifice, altruism from individuals. Um, and interestingly enough, in my writings on this subject and in, in um, uh, Rabbi Sachs's, Rabbi Sachs actually never had a chance to write this up before he tragically died. His thoughts are uh, contained in a, in his, as far as I know, his last lecture, which was given in, at New York University. Um, and in the footnotes of this paper, I, I cite that so you can go and listen to it, but I don't think it's ever been written up. Um, we both cite the same passage about, about Darwin's recognition of the importance of altruism. Darwin, altruism. Tribes characterized by um, selfishness, uh, he wrote, that is Darwin wrote, would be victorious, I'm sorry, tribes characterized by such selflessness, by altruism, would be victorious over most other tribes, and this would be natural selection. Darwin never endorsed the simple-minded ideas of people who were called social Darwinists. They extolled the, un the unprincipled pursuit of, of self-interest, whereas Darwin was very specific. Despite all of his emphasis on competition, he was specific that among humans, altruism and self-sacrifice was necessary for advancement. Conversely, Tocqueville is said to have coined the very term individualism, Tocqueville, to describe Americans' emphasis on self-interest. But he argued that the principle of American democracy, the secret of American democracy, uh, was the principle of what he called self-interest, self-interest rightly understood. The principle, he argued, shapes a multitude of citizens who are orderly, temperate, moderate, foresighted, <coughs> pardon me, and masters of themselves. The very title of the relevant chapter in democracy in America is How Americans Combat Individualism by the Doctrine of Self-Interest Rightly Understood. In short, as Rabbi Sachs pointed in this one of his final lectures, Darwin's theory of evolution and de Tocqueville's description of American democracy can be directly mapped onto one another. We and I are not, in the end, not polar opposites, but need to be integrated into a more comprehensive understanding of our society, indeed of life itself. And Rabbi Sachs observed, as, as I do, Modern society currently finds itself in the midst of a culture, an overwhelming culture of individualism, a culture of I, whereas both he and I fervently believe that we need a fuller, what the world needs now is a fuller recognition of the power of we. It's astonishing to me, actually, and a matter of no little pride, that Rabbi Sachs and I, entirely unbeknownst to each other, recognize the deep parallels between Darwin and Tocqueville. We both see that alongside competition, we need cooperation. What he called civil society, and what I term social capital. Although I'm proud to say that Rabbi Sachs came to use the idea of social capital and understand it exactly the same way that I do. For obvious reasons, Rabbi Sachs focused more on the role of religion than I do, although I am touched that he specifically cited my own work on religion. But most fundamentally, we both agree that a society needs, in very practical terms, to be rooted in morality 
and a sense of community. Most theorists have assumed that individualistic competition and communitarian cooperation are opposite ends of a simple continuum. But both Darwin and Tocqueville learned in their voyages that the choice between individualism and communitarianism is false, that a more complicated theory must encompass both competition and cooperation. Thus, this is the most fundamental lesson from the, these remarkable journeys by these two young explorers nearly two centuries ago. And it turns out to be astonishingly timely in up to the public problems that we right now face. And Rabbi Sachs saw this very clearly, explicitly says this, this understanding of the role of cooperation in society is relevant to the problems we face right now, both Tocqueville's principle of self-interest rightly understood and Darwin's recognition that, that among humans, altruism is biologically advantageous is directly relevant to our contemporary, contemporary debates, our fights today about face masks and about vaccination, about global warming and about, in America, gun control and even the survival of democracy embody precisely the tensions between our rights as individuals and our responsibility to the community. Unless we take seriously Tocqueville's idea of self-interest rightly understood, our democracies will not survive. Unless we take seriously the accounts, the, the Darwin's insights about the impact of our behavior on other human beings, the human species will not survive. Tocqueville shows that the survival of our democracy depends upon resolving this dilemma. And Darwin reminds us that our physical survival does too. For this fundamental insight, we are all deeply indebted to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear the applause. Uh... Bob, but it's loud and clear. That was, Thank you. That was fascinating, uh, profound, and profoundly important to the challenges um, that Israel, America, and Western society and the world in general face. So thank you very much for that, and thank you for showing us um, the connection that binds this conference together, which brings together the Department of Political Studies. And Daniel Elazar insisted that it would be called political studies and not political science. But in a classic Israeli compromise in Hebrew, it's called political science. Um, so political studies on the one hand and Jewish philosophy um, on the other hand. Um, I'd like now to uh, open the floor to questions. What I'm going to do is if you ask the question to me, then I'll read it into the microphone um, for uh, Professor Putnam. Yes. It's not really a question, just a clarification that in his most, I think his last book called Morality, Jonathan Sachs, early in the book, he brings this whole story of 1831. Mm -hmm. You said it wasn't written. It wasn't yeah, written. so um, uh, just to note there that Jonathan Sachs managed to find a place for that story in Morality, in the book Morality. That, so it's there, it is there as well as the last lecture. Yes, question from the back. I brought a similar question up in the Rabbi Benamosa conference a couple weeks ago. You have these um, ideas that are twisted and horribly hurt humanity. Darwin's theory of evolution and survival of the fittest was twisted into policies that basically said if people are overworked at factories and get sick or die, too bad, right? I mean, so how do you have these uh, ideas that got terribly twisted into survival of the fittest uh, and, and hurt millions of people, how do you prevent that? Okay, that's, that's a nice easy one. Um, <laughs> the, the Charles Darwin's oh, theory sorry. of survival of the fittest uh, got twisted into the social Darwinism of... Yes. Yeah. So the question is, how did it happen and how can we prevent it from happening? What a really good question. Um, uh, first of all, to be we just need to, I mean, I'm sure the questioner and I both understand this. Darwin himself was not a social Darwinist. Um, he 
the social Darwinists, uh, who were very dominant in American public philosophy, actually, at the end of the 19th century, they observed, look, Darwin says, um, red and truth and crawl, a competition, the devil take the hindmost, that works, they said, Darwin says that works in natural, in, uh, natural society, let's apply the same thing to human society, and therefore they said, for example, some just unbelievably dumb things, they said, we would all be better off if we, actually the world would be better off if rich people did not give anything away, because that's only sustaining the less um, healthy genes. I mean, I mean, it led directly to racism, and frankly, it led directly to the Holocaust. That social Darwinism is a direct line between, between the social Darwinists and the Shoah. Um, Darwin himself, as I've said, did not hold that view. He held, in, in fact, the opposite view. The human evolution was encouraged by altruism. Um, I, it, the, the, so I've, I've now, now just stated the dilemma, that the, I've restated what the questioner asked, which is how did that happen? And honestly, to some extent, I don't know, because when you actually state it the way I just did, that these, the social Darwinists were saying, we're all better off, it's morally right, if we sacrifice the least able people to the most able people. That seems just despicable. How could anybody have thought that? And all, all I can conclude is that it was intimately bound up with the racism of that period. That is, in fact, they were, they were racist. That's the true fact. They were racist with respect to blacks. They were racist with respect to Jews. They were just racist, those social Darwinists. And they were drawing on what was at that point the, the pop culture um, enthusiasm about Darwin. So I guess what we have to say is we've got to think always carefully and not make simple-minded Trans translations from one field into another field. Thank I you. mean, it's a good question. I wish I had a better answer. Thank you. Uh, yes, at the back. I recently saw a podcast where uh, Darwin was used um, to uh, describe lobsters and then used that as a uh, parallel to tell us basically again that, you know, uh, in these days, we should, you know, capitalism should be in favor of the rich and therefore that, that's kind of self-selection. Um, and, and often these theories seem to uh, correlate also with a more fundamentalist religious grouping. Is there, does, does the professor see a connection between those two things? Okay, so the, the question is that we've spoken about um, survival of the fittest in capitalist terms, in sort of a brutal capitalism. Um, the questioner uh, asks, can we see that also a connection um, is feeding into religious fundamentalism or religious extremism? Is there a connection there between uh, a Darwinist, a social Darwinist influence on, on that kind of thinking? Um, right, I understand the question perfectly well, and so did Jonathan Sachs actually understand this question perfectly well. I'm a little bit reluctant to an Israeli audience at exactly this period to get into a dis discussion of um, orthodox religion and religious extremism and so on, because I don't want to have a misstep here, and I know that I'm, anything I say from this point on is likely to get me in trouble with somebody. <laughs> and maybe it would even get Jonathan uh, Sachs in trouble with somebody. Jonathan was very clear. He was himself very tolerant. He was, of course, thoroughly Jewish. But he was very, very tolerant. And I know, um, I don't want to get too far into this, but I personally am a convert to Judaism. He couldn't, strictly, I wasn't really Jewish because I had not been converted by an Orthodox rabbi. And yet we had immensely close discussions of religion. And he was personally, probably the most tolerant, religiously tolerant person I know. And in this, in the, I'm glad to know that that his ideas about Tocqueville and Darwin have appeared in writing in the book Morality. I did not know that, but in the article, I mean, the lecture actually is long, and in that he makes very clear that what is needed is uh, it to, in order to, that the moral basis of society needs to be religion, and he doesn't, he almost says it doesn't matter what kind of religion, he doesn't even have to be religion at one point he suggests. Now, got to be careful, because of course he was a devout Jew, I understand that, but um, I, I don't 
let me speak for myself. I do think that there's a connection between religious extremism and this emphasis today on the on I and not we. That is, in America, let me speak about America, not about Israel. In America, though you would think that evangelical Protestants, the most extreme evangelical Protestants, would be focused on the we, right? If you read the Sermon on the Mount, for example, I mean, speaking of Christianity, read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was for sure a communitarian. He didn't say, you know, good for the rich and the devil take the highmost. He said, it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than to, for, I, for a camel to go through the eye of needle. Read the Sermon on the Mount. So you would think that evangelical Protestants would be very focused on our obligations to one another. They, at the moment, seem to be caught up in this excessively I focus on self-salvation, not on what we should do to other people. I'm afraid that was maybe a little confusing because I was trying to avoid controversy, but I probably plunged myself even deeper into controversy. Okay, well, I think you did extremely well in navigating that, but there will be headlines. Um, yes. Uh, yes, Josh. Uh, we spent uh, two days uh, hearing Jews talk to Jews about a great Jew. Uh, I was wondering if Professor Putnam could share a little bit with us about uh, how the, the relationship began and what its nature was with Rabbi Sachs, and also what strikes him uh, about Rabbi Sachs' work in the book. Okay. Let's see if I can get this right. <laughs> we spent uh, two days of Jews talking to Jews about a great Jew. Um, right. What we'd like to know from you is a little bit about how you and Rabbi Sachs uh, began to develop your relationship, a little bit about uh, your discussions, and about what you think Rabbi Sachs is seeking. Sig yeah, what, what, what stands out for you about his work? Um, well, um, it's a complicated story, actually, and I'll try to be brief. Um, I am a convert to Judaism. I converted to Judaism uh, more than 60 years ago. At the time, I was dating a young woman uh, who was Jewish. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do. I convinced myself that, um, that uh, I'm sorry, being personal about my own religion, but it's relevant to the question of Rabbi Sachs. I apologize for this personal digression. Um, long story short, um, I started hanging out with this young woman. We're still hanging out. She's actually in the other room here. Um, and we had two kids. Both of our kids um, fell in love with non-Jews, and we could hardly object to that because we were... But then... Um, their partners converted to Judaism too. So now we started with one Jew, Rosemary, and we now have four Jews. Um, Rosemary and me and our two kids and their spouses, no, seven or eight Jews. We then have seven grandchildren and all of them are bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah. So now we have, from one Jew, a minion. Um, a minion if you count women as, as, for a minion, for purposes of a minion. Um, I'm a reformed Jew, so we do count women as, as a part of the community. Um, so I think of myself as fully Jewish. Um, and this is the point I wanted to make. Strictly speaking, and, and Rabbi Sachs and I talked about this. Strictly speaking, he did not consider me a Jew. And he was a little uneasy about my grandchildren, well, they were Jews. Of course, you know, it was matrilineal, but nevertheless, um, when he learned that my youngest grandson was being bar mitzvah, he handed me, I'm going to tear up now, he handed me a signed, signed by Rabbi Sachs, um, a copy of the Holy Book. And, I mean, he was, he, what I'm trying to say is, we bonded actually over being Jews in a strange way, even though I'm a convert and he doesn't believe in conversion. You, you see what I'm trying to say? That's the, that's where we, Connected. I'm sorry we've gotten so personal about that. So let me step back. He learned about my work first because he read about social capital, and I learned about his work, and therefore we met, and we corresponded for a long time transatlantically, and then I went and visited him several times in, in London. That's when he handed me this book for my, um, for my grandson. Um, and so we had a strange, we had also a personal relationship. That's what I'm trying to convey. 
Um, so, and also, I, what I'm trying to say is, I can't say what a non-Jew really thinks of Rabbi Sachs, because in the fundamental ways, I'm a Jew. And I'm a Jew, let me say this in part, I'm a Jew fully, wholeheartedly a Jew because Judaism is such a communal religion. It's not, Judaism is not about theology. Indeed, studies have shown, my own studies have shown, most Jews in America are atheists. But what makes them Jews and what makes them think they're Jews correctly is they're part of a community. So there's a non-accidental connection between Judaism and communitarianism. And Rabbi Sachs' work embodies that. And I'm along for the ride. You're getting a lot of applause now. That, that, that was very moving, and it, and it also speaks to a lot of the papers that have been presented here today. Um, yes, uh, Professor Kapp. Yeah, uh, oh, I have to ask you that, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, so someone asked a question about the distortion of Darwin into the type of social Darwinism. I remember the person whom I read a moral philosopher who opposed this, based on her knowledge of, of biology, was Mary Midgley, who uh, very much uh, emphasized Darwin in terms of cooperation, in terms of, of emotions. And also, Midgley is very much opposed to the solitary self and moral isolationism like Rabbi Sachs. And I seem to remember, there are people who are much more expert that. Uh, Rabbi Sachs was in, influenced or a dialogue with, with Midgley. So maybe you you know you might want to comment on that. Okay. Mary Midgley, does the name mean something to you? And if it does I'm sorry not. No, okay. okay. So we'll pass on that one. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm I apologize. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, very few of us are absolute individualists. Or absolute communitarianism. That is, very few of us think only about the I and totally neglect the we, and vice versa. So it seems to me that the real serious problem in life is how do we navigate the balance between the two? Okay. And I'm wondering if uh, Professor Putnam would like to uh, share his wisdom about that. Okay. Uh, very few of us are either an I or a we completely. How do we find in practice and in conceptually the balance between the correct balance between the two? Well, um, in the first point is that the fact that there's not just, you know, communitarianism all good and individualism all bad, which would be a simple minded way of reading some work. Um, both Rabbi Sachs and I learned from Tocqueville and Darwin that you can't treat those as separate polar cases. So uh, the first thing to say is I not only do I agree with the questioner that there's a that no, none of us is either a purely individualist or purely communitarian. What I mean, what I have learned from the Darwin, well, I've learned partly from Jonathan Sachs, but partly from the comparison between Tocqueville and Darwin, is that a fuller conception, and Rabbi Sachs, I'm almost quoting Rabbi Sachs now, a fuller conception has got to understand that there are times and places when individualism is um, appropriate or maybe just necessary, and times and places when we have to think about um, our obligations to others. He, for example, said, and I'm now just quoting this lecture uh, that he gave at NYU, um, he said there are spheres, economic spheres, for example, which are zero sum. You, you know, get a raise, or I don't, or I get a raise, but we don't both. We can't both have the same dollar. And he also thought that politics was power was essentially zero sum. Actually, I don't agree with that. I think that power is not a zero sum concept. That both you and I can gain by finding a, a mutual compromise. Um, uh, I don't have any theoretical reconciliation of, in response to the question, I don't have a theoretical um, reconciliation of exactly when we have to think about it, when we should think about ourselves as individuals and when we should think about ourselves as communitarians. And of course, if we delve deeper into this, I don't have time for that, but there are, we belong to many different communities. So 
we have obligations to some communities, like our family, and other obligations to other communities. Um, and so I, I don't think, A, I don't think this is a simple problem, and, and B, I don't think Jonathan Sachs thought it was a simple problem. I mean, he says, this is something that we have to wrestle with. There's not a simple geometric answer to the question, when should we be individualists and when should we be communitarians? I do think that both he and I thought, and this is where I would put my flag, both he and I thought that whatever the right balance is between the I and the we, contemporary Western society, and above all, contemporary America, is way over, to, way unbalanced toward the I right now. I mean, and there are millions of examples of that, and actually, when I began writing about this 20 or 30 years ago, that was a controversial position. Now, almost everybody in America agrees that America is stuck in dramatic overemphasis on, on, on the I. Um, so, whatever the right balance is between individualism and communitarianism, right now we're just way out of balance. Way polarized politically, way unequal economically, way disconnected. The, it, that's, that's, if you had to say there was one thing wrong with America now that explains everything, it is that we're too focused on I. So I'm not yet worried about, you know, could we get too far the other way? I want to say now what I'm worried about is getting us back on track to a more we society. Thank you. And the final question uh, from Professor Adam Fersiger. Thank you very much, Professor Putnam. Um, one of the things that's been discussed quite a bit is Rabbi Sachs as a public intellectual. Uh, he was, uh, he predicated his career on the rabbinate and uh, public roles. You are uh, based in the academy, but you certainly have that in common. And uh, really taking from what you just uh, left off, um, 30 years ago, you wrote um, Bowling Alone, uh, which essentially raised these issues, and uh, it raised a lot of discussion. Nonetheless, you are saying now that there's a frustration because the, the tide has just moved even further. So could you just talk a little bit about how you see a public intellectual being able to impact on society and what you have in mind when you think about writing the books and and, and, and speaking about the issues that you speak about. Did you catch that? I got most of it, yeah. Um, and it's, if I understood it correctly, that is, what's the role of public intellectual? And, you know, in a way, my career proves that public intellectuals have no effect. I mean, I've been working, <laughs> I've been preaching. Actually, you know, there's a little bit of a preacher in me, in fact. Um, or as one person said, he's like an Old Testament prophet with charts. Um, I, really like, I really like that uh, epithet. Um, so when I so I've been preaching, you know, but that's you know, prophets <laughs> Isaiah or all the rest of them, they knew what it was like to be preaching and not having anybody anybody listen. So I that I, I comfort myself in that respect. Well, that's an, a terribly self-centered kind of comment, uh, putting myself in the same category as Isaiah. Um, look, um, I'm I am my most recent book. I'm not trying to sell more books, but my most recent book is very specifically aimed at trying to change America. Trying to maybe not change history, but bend history a little bit. And um, that over, over the course of my career, I gradually moved from being, as I get older actually, I gradually moved from being trying to be descriptive, thoughtfully descriptive, to being very prescriptive. And I I won't bother this audience with my prescriptions of American society, but I have, in this book called The Upswing, how we came together a century ago and how we can do it again, um, I lay out some very specific things that we ought to do, some of which are happening now, actually, um, in the aftermath of the defeat of Trump, or at least the so far defeat of Trump. I want, by the way, I want to emphasize just to avoid misunderstanding. This trend toward I and away from me predates Trump by 40 or 50 years. Trump is a symptom of America becoming an excessively I society. And it took us a long time to get here, and 
even if Trump is, you know, defeated and ends up on the dustbin of history, we still have this problem. It's not going to go away. But it means a lot of things. But finally, I'm sorry I've gone on so long, but this is true. The, as in the book, this most recent book, um, my co-author, uh, Shane Romney Garrett, and I conclude that the first thing that has to happen is there has to be a moral reawakening in America this is the social sciences saying this. We have to have a moral re reawakening in America, a more pay more attention to our obligations to other people. And it's not that we we say change some policy a little, we twist this policy knob and suddenly we're in a better position. We won't begin to twist that policy knob until large numbers of Americans, and this has happened before in American history, become seized of their moral obligations. So. You know, in the end, I guess I kind of think preachers in this sort of secular preachers have to play a crucial role if we're going to get out of this fix we're in. I'm sorry to go on so long. Professor Putnam, thank you so much, not only for a wonderful lecture. They're still applauding, but not only for a wonderful lecture, but Jonathan Sachs had a, had a tradition of doing conversations, public conversations with leading public intellectuals. And while he couldn't be here in person, I felt that we somehow managed at least to res retain a resemblance of that tradition. So thank you very much for engaging in such a wonderful conversation as well. Thank you all very much. I'm honored and pleased to be here. Thank you. And maybe someday in person. Yes, hopefully someday in person. Okay. Okay, there's a, a coffee break for 30 seconds.